Good morning and welcome to uh, today's webinar. It's my pleasure uh, to uh, welcome everyone from uh, around the globe to join us today to talk about this important topic of the development of biorepositories uh, in um, low and middle income countries and the response to uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. My name is Christopher Woods. Uh, I'm an infectious disease physician and uh, medical microbiologist. I work as a professor of medicine, global health and pathology at Duke University. And I also serve as co-chair of uh, the coalitions, uh, the COVID-19 clinical research coalitions, virology, immunology and diagnostics working group. The impetus for today's um, uh, discussions uh, I believe is obvious. We are uh, now facing globally the emergence of uh, the Delta variant and it's wreaking havoc uh, around the globe. Um, this is after we have uh, had such a uh, remarkable response to the pandemic, developing diagnostics and uh, therapeutics and vaccines in uh, a remarkably short period of time. Uh, we now need to uh, come together to respond to this new challenge. Um, and part of that is making sure that uh, we are monitoring the situation uh, effectively uh, around the globe, particularly in locations which uh, have not traditionally had the resources to provide that ongoing surveillance and sequencing technology that we have learned is so important to fight uh, a, a pandemic of the proportions which we've been experiencing for the last 18 months. So uh, a word on the COVID-19 Clinical Research Coalition. This is a uh, group of uh, respected scientists from around the globe um, initiated in April of 2020 to uh, uh, leverage uh, the uh, expertise of uh, global investigators uh, and to promote the open sharing of research, knowledge, um, and data. In particular, we seek to champion the equitable and affordable access to COVID-19 uh, vaccines, diagnostics, and treatments. We have global representation. Uh, the numbers are shown on the slide. We have we work through 13 topic-specific groups, including ethics, data sharing, clinical epidemiology, and as uh, the sponsor of this particular webinar, the diagnostics uh, or the immunology, virology, and diagnostics working group. So a few housekeeping announcements for today. Um, the meeting is being, being recorded and we'll have a link to the uh, meeting which will be published. Please use the Q&A tool. The chat function has been uh, disabled for those of you in attendance. So use the Q&A tool as you can. Uh, if, as you watch the or participate in the webinar, you can upvote on uh, individuals' questions to add emphasis uh, to make it more likely that the speakers will have the opportunity to um, respond to your question. If you want to address uh, a particular speaker, please include the speaker's name with your question. We will have a short survey at the end of the webinar. Please complete that for us. So our agenda for today, we have three uh, um, excellent um, presentations. Uh, on, uh, Dr. Kurtika Patel, Dr. Blandina Mbaga, and Rogers Kamalukea. Um, who is presenting on behalf of Masaki Wangera, uh, my colleague and co-chair of the uh, working group, Dr. Wilbur Sabiti, will uh, lead the question and answer um, period at the uh, end of the presentations. All of our presenters have, uh, uh, have been part of the uh, res leaders in the response in their respective countries. So to get us started on today's uh, webinar, Dr. Kirtika Patel comes, as, comes to us <clears throat> from Amoy University, where she is a senior lecturer and the head of the Department of Immunology and School uh, of Medicine in the College of Health Sciences. She's also a member of the Society of Immunology and the British Society of Allergy and Clinical Immunology. 
She has been working with biorepositories for many years preceding the, um, the pandemic and uh, will uh, give us the Kenyan perspective. So Kurtika, please. Thank you very much, Chris, for that kind introduction. Um, I'm also now the Chair of Pathology and uh, uh, the PI for setting up biorepositories in our institution, uh, which is more university, uh, which is in the western part of Kenya. And it is um, the largest research center in the region, which informs policy and practice in Kenya and globally. It does cutting edge research in infectious and non-infectious diseases. And we have a, a collaborative research with uh, uh, nationally and internationally. We are on site uh, at the Moy Teaching and Referral Hospital, which is a level six hospital with thousand bed capacity and serves a population, uh, half the population of Kenya, around 24 million people and parts of Eastern Uganda and Southern Sudan as we share borders with those countries. We also have a partnership with AMPATH, which is a consortium of North American universities, primarily led by Indiana University, and they have a mandate of care, training, and research. In Western Kenya, we have uh, more than 50 uh, clinical sites, so we go to our patients and serve them, um, uh, along with um, uh, satellite clinics associated with uh, the hospitals. The purpose of biorepository, um, as you all know, is to maintain biological specimens and associated information for further use in research and clinical trials. And in the pandemic, it is urgently needed for all the countries to um, bank their specimens uh, for diagnostic, therapeutics, vaccines, for uh, confirming um, cases of uh, reinfection and investigation and uh, breakthrough in vaccines. There are various different types of biorepositories, maybe university-based, institutional-based, government biorepositories, commercial biorepositories, population biobanks as in the UK, and the latest trend is to have virtual biobanks. The MUI biorepository uh, uh, supports a lot of research in sexual health, mental health, cardiovascular genomics, malaria infection, pharmacokinetics, viral resistance, HIV AIDS clinical trial, a lot of work on cancer and pharmacogenomics. And currently COVID-19, we are involved in the solidarity um, clinical trials and uh, the Moderna va vaccine and um, the GAMPIC project, uh, to name a few. Uh, just to let you know, um, uh, just in the last year, we have banked 120,000 specimens uh, from, from 25 active studies and had numerous publications. We built our biobank uh, on the building blocks of existing facilities where we had PI storing their um, samples in different freezers and we wanted to harmonize everything and create one uh, common facility and wanted to be uh, and we would like to be the uh, new facility leader in biobanking in our region in East Africa. So we wrote this proposal uh, that was supported by Indiana University PSI initiative. And with the institution support, um, uh, we acquired a wing on in the new building at the Chandaria Cancer Center. And the institution has supported us with uh, uh, waiving off the rent, electricity and water. Every biobank should have uh, uh, an organogram and this looks quite uh, complex, but just uh, a take home message from this slide is um, uh, with the re rest of the processes, uh, it's a good idea to include uh, community representation and legal representation for your biorepository. Uh, this is a picture of our biorepository, which has space for uh, 15 freezers and um, it is uh, ventilated and temperature controlled. We have uh, air conditionings fitted in there um, and um, uh, it's um, got a good ventilation and air. Uh, it is a highly restricted excess uh, region um, with uh, backup generators and fire alarms uh, and fire extinguishers. Uh, we do not have the liquid nitrogen facility as yet, but we are moving towards that. Uh, our biggest asset uh, at the Moi uh, University is our motivated trained personnel. 
um, uh, they were trained in at, at Indiana University and also locally as well. And um, uh, uh, we process our samples in the bio repository and store them so it minimizes the transportation. Uh, our freezers are managed by web-based um, temperature monitoring system. And um, it's a good system. I mean, I could be uh, sitting here in the UK and uh, monitoring my freezers in Kenya. So uh, it's a good system. This is a picture of some of the samples that are ready to be shipped out. Um, we also, uh, at, which is a mandatory requirement, we have an LDMS system, which is a specimen management system that um, helps us with the shipping, tracking of shipments, management of volumes, location within the lab, specimen type logging, and storage procedures are also managed. Uh, it is password protected um, uh, with uh, dual authentication. And the data is housed on a server which is hosted outside the Mu University premises. This is an example of uh, barcoding generated uh, for one of our samples where this is the sample ID um, and the project it is involved in, the date, the time, and the type of sample. It could be blood, serum, plasma, urine, saliva, um, and the amount stored. This is a picture of a computer screen on the LDMS where it shows uh, along with all the other details, the status of our samples as well. So this was the infrastructure. And if you wanted to uh, have your own biorepository, there's a lot to think about. Uh, you need to um, think about the SOPs uh, for specimen collection, processing, storing, retrieval, your material transfer agreements. Remember you are as good as your, SO, your lab is as good as your SOPs um, and every tiny detail needs to be documented. And your specimen, you are with your specimen from cradle to grave. So uh, all the processes have to be recorded. Uh, think about a business contingency plan um, and various backups and uh, um, IT support would be really needed. Um, training is mandatory for old and new staff, and um, we found a uh, disaster drills helped us a lot. A lot of resources are available now, and is best practice and uh, NCI have good uh, practices. Please do not forget the ethics and legal and informed consent for the samples, um, uh, which would be dictated by the federal regulation or your local IRB. Ours is IREC. Uh, this is a slide from ISBER, and when we started, these, these were the mandatory documents that you need to have that you can build up on, uh, starting with the SOPs uh, to QAQC and also specimen donor related. Yes, of course, we have challenges, uh, like all uh, challenges in LMICs. Uh, we, you need to think about backups for water, electricity, a low bandwidth since um, a, lo a lot of your work would be web-based and uh, uh, human resources. Uh, we found it very important to train our staff in uh, on site so that we could uh, mitigate any problems we have on site. And uh, another thing that we need to be mindful about, especially in our countries, is um, uh, we just ordered a freezer, we gave the specifications and what came to us was not what we had ordered. So uh, that is very important to uh, take note uh, and be savvy about your ordering and processing. Um, uh, I'd like to thank um, uh, the institutions, IUPSI, and um, uh, here I have three uh, team over here of biobankers, they call themselves along with the bigger team. These are the backbone of our biorepository. Thank you very much for listening to me. Uh, there's a question on biorepository on the survey. Kindly answer that. Mm, I would like to, we would like to know uh, if you are planning to have a biorepository or have one, and we can form our own consortium and share ideas and help each other grow and um, uh, build ourselves. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that thorough review and such a brief time keeping us on track, Dr. Patel. Um, marvelous kickoff to the webinar. Our next speaker uh, is Dr. Uh, longtime colleague, Dr. Um, 
Blandina and Baga. Uh, she comes to us from, Kilim uh, from Moshi, Tanzania, where she runs the Kilimanjaro Clinical Research Institute, and she serves actively as a pediatrician there. Landina is leading many research activities uh, in infectious diseases for several years uh, and is, leads the, through her leadership of the uh, KCRI, um, uh, leads the biobanking and sequencing efforts in Tanzania. So, uh, Landina. Thank you very much, Chris, for the introduction. And I'm happy to share the experience of what we are doing at KCRI, especially in building capacity and the establishment of a biobanking a sequencing facilities within our institution. I will share with you also the challenges as well as opportunities which are available within our institution. So uh, my outline, I will just talk about the uh, KCRI profile and I will take you through uh, the genomic, bioinformatic, and biorepository, as well as some of the projects which has gone so far within our institution. I will share with you the opportunities, challenges, and uh, what are the future perspectives, especially uh, in relation to COVID-19. So KCRI is one of the Good Samaritan Foundation institutions, the youngest pillar, or we call it the third pillar, the first one being uh, the Kilimanjaro Christian Medical Center, which is the university teaching hospital established in 1971. The hospital has a bed uh, capacity of 638 beds. And it's also a teaching hospital for the second pillar, which is Kilimanjaro Christian Medical University College, which was established in 1997. And uh, the third pillar, which is KSRI, was established in 2009. As you can see, the building below here is uh, the KSRI Biotechnology uh, Laboratory, as well as the administrative area. And below the foot of the mountain, Kilimanjaro is where the institutions are, KSRI, KSMC, and KSMU College. We are situated on the northern part of Tanzania. Okay, and uh, our sequencing capacity uh, was started in the year 2014, where we established our genomic unit, and this was from the project which funded it by Danida. And this project also funded the capacity building by training two PhDs, one based on bioinformatics, and uh, one was based on uh, genomics. And from 2014, we had the Illumina Meister, and uh, 2021, through the Fleming Funds project on antimicrobial resistance, we had received the next sex sequencing, and also in uh, 2019, through the NHR uh, Gamvi project, we received the mini on. So we have this capacity within our laboratory, as well as the lab technicians are trained in both uh, free capacity. Looking into bioinformatics a unit, uh, 2014 when we started, we had a capacity of uh, one terabyte and only one computer uh, which we used. And it was a challenge in uploading the big data from the bioinformatics. And 2016, through the project uh, support, our capacity increased to three terabytes. And in 2019, our capacity uh, through the game project was increased to 200 terabytes. And currently, as we are, uh, through the capacity building grants, as well as the Fleming funds, our capacity has increased it to three terabytes. And now we are able to run a lot of data at once, as well as we have built capacity in analysis of uh, sequenced data. And uh, this capacity actually we have so far utilized in improving diagnosis of uh, priority pathogens within our uh, country, as well as our institution, uh, in terms of pathogenicity, virulence, as well uh, as antimicrobial resistance genes. We have also supported in enhancing uh, identification of hospital outbreaks within the hospital 
and also surveillance and sharing of emerging diseases. So uh, these are the pioneers team which has enabled establishment of the genomic unit from 2014 when Professor Gibson Kibik was the director of uh, KCRI and I took over in 2015 with the two PhD students, uh, Dr. Happiness Kumburu and the Tolbert Sonda who graduated their PhD in 2019 and currently they are running units and they have other uh, young peers who they are training into this as Frank Ostrup, who was the first uh, PI of the genomic project and uh, Marco, who is also working with Isonda in running the unit of bioinformatics. We do have also established biorepository capacity because we are running clinical trials especially trials related to uh, uh, MDR RTBs as well as uh, HIV clinical trials. So we have been uh, built capacity into biobanking and storage. We have more than freezers within our biorepository, uh, cutting across minus 20, minus 40, and minus 8. And we also have the liquid nitrogen within KCMC, there is a uh, oxygen plant as well as liquid nitrogen plant, which supports uh, the project which we are also working on. And uh, we are, keep, we are uh, keeping the samples for short term as well as for long term storage within our institution. And as you can see here is the KCRI biorepository unit where we do biobank and uh, storage of samples. And uh, this other fourth is the liquid nitrogen, which is supporting us, especially for PBMC storage. And we are also participating in PBMC external quality assurance and providing materials for uh, quality assurance. We are also having temperature monitoring uh, device, which is enabled us to monitor our uh, freezers as well as two backup generators, which are supporting us whenever there is uh, any challenges with electricity. We are storing varieties of uh, samples from urine, saliva, stool, as well as uh, sputum. We do ho have also storage of hair and nails for studying of drug levels, although this most of the time they don't need a biorepository as we can uh, store them even in a normal room temperature. We are also participating in uh, external quality assurance with different uh, providers, but also our laboratory has been GCLP accredited by the Kualo Company UK in May 2021. And this here is our accreditation certificate we are doing regular internal and uh, we are also participating in annual external lab auditing to make sure that our laboratory is in a good quality. So what we have done so far on the genomic, uh, different genomic projects, we have done the whole genome sequencing based investigation. Uh, this was 2014-2019 and this was uh, the one who contributed to building capacity and we have a biobanking of more than 500 bacteria uh, samples, which had undergone sequencing. And also we have contributed to countrywide antimicrobial surveillance as we are funded by Fleming funds. This is the one which has increased the capacity of our biorepository as uh, we are looking forward to ourselves to become a center of excellence in sequencing uh, within Africa. And for this one, we are planning to sequence more than 500 isolates from a uh, local, that means from seven regions in Tanzania, but also uh, samples from East Africa. We are also uh, having uh, another project which is, was just currently funded and supporting decentralization of sequencing within the country. And this is building capacity to uh, five regions in uh, sequencing by using the mini on nanopore. We have participated in uh, running the samples for cholera for the East African Commission, more than 1,000 samples. We have just finished with the sample from Uganda and we will share the results soon. But uh, we have done also 
some projects uh, in TB, uh, sickle cell, as well as virus uh, resistance genome. So uh, the opportunities uh, within our institution, we do have a larger opportunity for collaboration, but also for supporting regions and countries uh, within Africa, as well as our own country in Tanzania, by uh, using the capacity we have built. First of all, being a tertiary and teaching hospital, we do have access uh, to patients of different kinds, including the COVID-19. We do have an oxygen plant on site, as well as nit liquid nitrogen, which is potential in sample storage. But as uh, for capacity building, we are a training node for the Eastern Africa Consortium for Clinical Research. Myself, I'm the deputy director for the consortium. And we do have a whole student field work attachment for more than six universities within Tanzania because of advanced molecular capacity, which we do have in our laboratory. And we are participating in training most of these lab technicians within the country. And we have uh, skilled technicians who are willing to learn new technologies as well as teach others in those new technologies. We are quite uh, participating more in One Health re related research, and we do have a zoonosis laboratory, and we are participating in most of the outbreak, like for anthrax and uh, brucella, leptospira, as well as other zoonosis diseases. So we are one of uh, zoonosis hubs within uh, Tanzania. So with all the opportunities we are having, we are facing also the challenges, especially in running the, by, uh, the bioinformatics and uh, sequencing within uh, Tanzania. We are getting the challenge in procurement difficulties for the last one year, we have spent most of our time in troubleshooting because we received reagents which were not of a good quality. And uh, we had six kits which we ran just for troubleshooting till when uh, the company agreed with us that the reagents were not good and they have to uh, repay back the reagents. And this has set us back in most of the activities which we are doing. And now they have moved uh, from the previous vendor and provided us a vendor within the Tanzania. Hopefully things will change, although we have started uh, seeing the challenges, especially in a long-term duration. We all know across the world, because of COVID-19, getting materials and the shipment is quite a very big challenge. And a service contract of the equipment, uh, our uh, laboratory, we do have a lot of sophisticated equipment, which are quite expensive in uh, taking care for service, regular service contract, but we are trying as much as we can, especially from projects which we are running and even running the freezer themselves is not an easy task because of the electricity as well as care of it. And within our biorepository, I can see the biggest challenge we are facing. A lot of investigators, they do uh, store samples during their activities, but some of them, whenever the activities ends, they don't want to come back and take the samples which have been by banking or to allow even using the samples. Sometimes it's becoming a challenge because they keep on holding while they're not paying for supporting the storage. This, I find myself that is a big challenge but also uh, the issue of electricity and internet, especially because we need internet in uploading bioinformatics materials. We have tried it to look at a best kind of internet and having a larger bandwidth, but we hope that uh, the sustainability is quite something we are, uh, we are thinking about and how to keep it. Therefore, uh, we are looking into more collaboration so that we can be able to keep this uh, facilities and equipment and the capacity which we have established for quite many years. And also sustainability, uh, I see the challenge because mostly we are depending on research funds. Uh, for that reason, we are working with some monocular collaborators as well as consortium to make sure that uh, our capacity uh, are retained and we are able to handle any kind of the activities within our lab because we know that losing the capacity building it is never been easy.
So a uh, future perspective, we are looking ourselves into becoming one of the stronger uh, partner within larger consortium, which are pushing genomic research agenda in Africa, as well as to expand our capacity to COVID-19 genomics. And uh, we are looking into ourselves becoming a center of excellence in sequencing and utilize the available bioinformatics and uh, genomic capacity we have uh, built so far to support national COVID-19 research pillar in understanding the different variants which might be circulating in our, our country, as well as supporting other low and middle income countries. Currently, we are receiving samples from Ethiopia, from Rwanda, Zambia, and we expect to support more countries in different activities which uh, we are doing, and especially capacity building and the training. We are looking to strengthen our biobank for sample uh, storage for future studies, as well as uh, creating a mass of competent research scientists to spearhead genomic and bioinformatics unity within Africa. So we do have many collaborators, but I have mentioned a few collaborators, including the leader who supported the initial capacity building, UK8, which is supporting the Fleming funds and what we are uh, doing so far, NHIR, which supported uh, our collaborator Warwick, in, and they have supported our bioinformatics capacity, as well as our institution, and we are working close with Minister of Health and the National Institute of Medical Research. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Mbaga. That was a, a wonderful review of uh, your work over the last eight years and starting sequencing and uh, the importance of that early investment in developing your expertise and putting you in a position to perform capacity development. Our final um, presenter today is um, Rogers uh, Kamalagea, uh, a, uh, a teacher, a biomedical researcher, and a molecular biologist trained in human genetics, genomics, and immunology, and, and works in biobanking uh, necessarily related to that. He's a member of the Uganda COVID-19 laboratory pillar, and he coordinates the integrated biorepository of H3 Africa Uganda. And he's presenting uh, on behalf of Dr. Wyangara, who is unable to uh, join us, but may be joining us in the question and answer uh, session uh, shortly. Rogers. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Good afternoon from this side. I hope all is well. Yes. Okay, now our topic for today, biorepositories and sequencing capacity in response to COVID-19, the case in Uganda. So let me start by talking about uh, the integrated biorepository of H3 Africa, uh, Uganda. Uh, this repository was set up under the HT Africa Consortium, uh, which has um, partners uh, in South Africa, partners in um, Western Africa, that's uh, Nigeria, and it was set up under the uh, NIH and also Wellcome Trust Fund. And um, this is what we do. We are involved in biobanking, but within biobanking, we know that uh, we influence research, we influence training, and we also offer a service to um, many people in the nation and <clears throat> in the region. Um, the integrated biorepository of H3 Africa, Uganda, is uh, situated in Makere University, uh, Kampala, under the College of Health Sciences. And in this, uh, it was set up with the main aim of uh, influencing genomics and environmental determinants uh, to guide in the uh, research and management of common diseases. And I would say that uh, just like uh, Patel and Blandina have explained, uh, the, we are moving through the same chain uh, of development, uh, trying to institutionalize, but also having uh, challenges here and there regarding sustainability, regarding power, uh, being uh, in Africa where uh, electricity is expensive and also 
um, something that uh, is hard to maintain. So as a biorepository, we have uh, backup generators to help uh, have the power running uh, to, to facilitate the, the facility, which has over 20 freezers, minus 80 and minus 20, and then uh, liquid nitrogen um, tanks. And in them, we have a variety of samples. We have uh, samples, uh, uh, bacterial isolates, we have uh, plasma, we have serum, we have environmental samples, which include hair, we are, uh, wristbands, uh, soil, plant material, uh, quite a variety. But uh, fast forward, uh, moving on to uh, COVID-19, uh, in Uganda, uh, uh, we received, uh, or we got the first case on the 21st of March, 2020. And as a biorepository, we saw it as an opportunity uh, to guide uh, the management of COVID-19 in Uganda. And immediately we drafted a proposal and received emergency approval to establish quality assured COVID-19 biospecimen uh, so that we can guide the science in that direction. And on 27th March, we were able to have that approval and begin the process. And I would say that uh, over time, we were able to successfully set up a COVID-19 biobank uh, with well annotated COVID-19 positive samples. And uh, we have over samples collected from over 2,000 samples, and we've been able to categorize them uh, between those who are symptomatic. Uh, we've been able to categorize them into those who are symptomatic and uh, also in the grade of uh, the disease, the, the, uh, we have the mild, we have uh, the severe. So all those samples, and we've been able to collect uh, quite a number of samples. We have a plasma from those patients. We have uh, serum from those patients. We have uh, stool, urine, and also we've been able to isolate PBMCs. And uh, these have been key in uh, uh, management of COVID-19 as uh, I'll be explaining. Um, and at the onset, we, uh, the, the, the market was flocked with many serological kits. And of course, we sought guidance, uh, Minister of Health sought guidance from us, since we already had the samples, to be able to validate kits and were able to validate over 10 serological kits at the beginning. And over time, we have been able to validate more and more kits. Uh, also, the samples that we have in the biorepository have been, uh, we've been sharing with uh, many companies. Uh, uh, this uh, is at, at, at the, uh, we were able also to validate the gene expert kit uh, uh, machine and on validation, it was um, dispatched to borders. Uh, in Uganda, we being an, a landlocked country, we depend on uh, uh, goods that come in through different countries. And at the onset of COVID, the major problem or the major contributor of COVID-19 in Uganda uh, were, uh, were, was importing uh, the COVID-19 from people who are coming in and uh, so we had to be able to test so fast so that we could isolate. And when we validated the expert, uh, it was uh, something very key and important that it helped in uh, curbing the spread of uh, the virus within the nation. So um, we have also been able to support three biotech companies and uh, one of them has successfully developed uh, a kit that is yet to be uh, rolled out on market, uh, still seeking a few approvals. And uh, that is Asto Diagnostics, uh, which has been able to manufacture its kit using the uh, samples uh, within the biobank. Uh, at the biobank, we have sequencing capacity. We have both Sanger sequencing and whole genome sequencing, and uh, we have been able to sequence uh, using the Arctic protocol. 
And this surely has guided together with a Uganda Virus Research Institute. Uh, we have been able to know what are the prevalent, um, what are the, uh, the prevalent variants within uh, Uganda. And this surely has uh, guided uh, in the management of uh, this. And currently we are working with the University of California Berkeley uh, to utilize uh, a cheaper method, uh, uh, which is the Plexwell technique, so that we can be able to uh, sequence uh, more and more samples uh, of COVID-19. So in summary, uh, this is a cartoon that talks about uh, some of the work that we've been able to do uh, regarding COVID-19. So we've been able to validate uh, 12 serological kits, the expert, uh, then four molecular-based kits, one antigen RDT kit, and then uh, with the biobank, we have given out many letters of support to researchers and uh, grants are coming in to utilize the samples. Uh, so yes, uh, that is our catalog as the biobank of H3 Africa, Uganda, which you can visit and also utilize many samples. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, uh, Rogers, particularly for doing that uh, at the last minute. A, a wonderful review of what's happening uh, in uh, Uganda. And uh, we've had three great exemplars uh, uh, from Kenya, from Tanzania, and from Uganda. Um, and we now are moving on to the question and answer portion of our webinar. Uh, this will be uh, led uh, on by my uh, colleague, friend, and co-chair, Dr. Wilbur Sabidi, who's a senior research scientist at the University of St. Andrews. Uh, his specialty is in the development of translational diagnostics and uh, as well as antimicrobial research. Uh, he co-leads the development and translation of the very first molecular test that quantifies tuberculosis bacterial load uh, in response to anti-TB therapy. Uh, and he is a graduate of uh, Makareri University in Uganda. Um, he will be leading the question and answer uh, portion for us, and I'll let him uh, talk about the housekeeping elements um, related to that. Wilbur. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Woods, and uh, the presenters for uh, keeping the time. Uh, we have around 15 minutes. Uh, for which I uh, would like us to use to answer the questions that have uh, come uh, across. Uh, I am looking through the chat uh, for the questions that have come and I'm going to read them out. Uh, there's one uh, from Brenda Okware, which said, how big is the contribution stroke influence of partnerships in the building by repositories. Uh, what is the main local contribution? So I think this either goes to uh, Katika or the, the rest can also share their experience. And we start with that quickly, maybe one minute from each or a few seconds. Thank you very much, Dr. Wilbur. Um, uh, thank you for this excellent question. Um, uh, yes, you cannot quantitate in terms of monetary, but uh, the North-South uh, partnerships are very important. Um, uh, for example, for us, we had Indiana University supporting us um, with a lot of equipment and technical know-how and training. And the institution gave us the uh, place, you could have all those. And if you didn't have the place to start your biorepository, it would not take place. So it is equal. I feel um, the partnerships are very important. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, Blandina, do you have any? Yes, go ahead. Thank you very much, Wilbur. Yes, I know uh, collaborators are playing a big role in supporting as uh, we are working together in a capacity building for our biorepository unit was built actually from the EDCTP support through the EHCRR uh, one and the EHCRR two. 
and supporting capacity building. And for this, we are currently uh, having the capacity. Uh, and a part of that, uh, we are getting also support uh, from the project we are working on, uh, which are supporting in purchasing the freezer and maintain the freezer and the units too, as well as uh, institutional capacity from what we are generating from different pro project activities is overhead or lab access are also supporting uh, upkeeping of our repository unit. Thank you. And what was the local contribution from your institution? Yeah, the local contribution from your institution, as you know that our mother institution is the KCMC, and the biggest local contribution has been uh, supporting personnel who are working within the uh, institute, uh, the laboratory. Uh, this is also the highest contribution from the government because the government is supporting uh, the human resource support within our institutions. Thank you very much. Rogers, do you have any comment about the role of collaborators uh, uh, in biopository and the local contribution that has been made by Macquarie University or Ugandan government? Uh, th thank you very much. Uh, actually, uh, biopositories have existed, or uh, all of us can say, uh, not that, that uh, but they have been existing uh, in houses or I would say in laboratories of researchers. They have mini biobanks, but then setting up uh, a general biobank uh, in Uganda, for example, uh, took uh, a, a grant uh, by the NIH support. So um, with that collaboration, actually it has opened up the eyes of even the government of Uganda and the government of Uganda is actually highly motivated to also support biorepositories. So um, um, when the government of Uganda joined in, uh, I would say currently we have uh, two more biorepositories that are being set up. So th that shows the power of collaboration that uh, uh, we have the NIH coming in, then we have government of Uganda coming in and we're having other researchers writing grants just to support um, by repositories to be set up. Uh, so collaboration is quite, quite very, very important in this case. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Rogers. And now we go to the next question, um, which comes from uh, Ikuo Takizawa. Are there deliberate efforts to obtain public or more sustainable funding to transform by repositories started by project funding into public goods with long-term research benefit. Uh, just in short, is, uh, is there effort to gain funding that would translate these biorepositories uh, into kind of long-term public goods? Because maybe they were started by uh, grant funding, which we know just stops within a few years. So what plans are there to make sure that these re uh, repositories stay uh, for a long time beyond the grant funding. Uh, who wants to go first? Rogers, go ahead. All right, thank you once again. Um, we are currently at the closure of the funding by NIH and we are still grappling uh, with the idea of sustainability. And uh, on my side, uh, we are exploring and thinking and believing that actually government and other public institutions are the best um, opportunities to have uh, biorepositories sustained. Uh, for example, we are based in Makere University and as a step towards sustainability, uh, we hand over our electricity bills, which is quite a very big expenditure on the side of the repository. And uh, when it is managed by the university itself, then it becomes a bit lighter to run the rest of the activities within the biorepositories. So it's a call uh, upon uh, governments uh, uh, within our uh, countries to take on this role of sustainability. Having seen, for example, in the case of COVID-19, that biopositories have been key. Uh, I know that there, there are many other researches that have been done and biopositories have been key. For example, the TB research in Uganda has major also been supported 
greatly uh, by, by, by repositories and HIV. So when government looks at it, it's yet an opportunity to carry on the mantle so that uh, we have many more biorepositories in regions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rogers. Katika Blandina, do you have any comment on that? Yeah, okay, I can take on. Yeah, for our part, as I said, uh, this biorepository was built around 2014, 2015. And from that time, we are running it as an institution, but our income is mostly from the project activities which we are working on. And uh, currently, as part of sustainability, not only for biorepository, but also for the biotechnology laboratory, we are working with the hospital, uh, which is uh, our key institution, in harmonizing and decentralizing most of the uh, activities, including the research activities and others, so that uh, we can be able to sustain uh, through uh, the institution itself, not just uh, retain ourselves. So we are working through the mechanism so that uh, the good infrastructure and the capacity we are, we are having will never collapse in case we don't have any project support to continue. But we believe that with the uh, current uh, uh, pandemic and other ongoing activities, we'll be able also uh, to uh, see how we can buy in with the government so that we could get support in to sustain some of these activities which are potential in storage of samples for future learning, uh, especially with a pandemic and other issues, yeah. Thank you, Brandina and Katika. Thank you very much. I agree with my colleagues from Uganda and Tanzania. We have similar challenges and uh, drawing up a business contingency plan is really nerve wracking. And um, so we are trying to do what they are doing as well. But um, uh, for uh, the new uh, plan is um, that any research that goes on has to include uh, biobanking capacity in their uh, built up uh, in their budget. So uh, a freezer or some uh, fund set aside for any new projects for biobanking. Uh, it might not be a lot to uh, in the beginning, but all small projects will add up and um, we hope to uh, sustain because building a biobank takes a long time. And once the donor funding uh, goes away, you do, do not want to collapse. Um, yes, we have institution support right now and electricity bills are being paid by them, but uh, I can, um, uh, like what my colleague said, uh, there, there will be a time when um, we will need support and we cannot always rely on external support. So building in plan with research proposals because uh, uh, we are guaranteed uh, we are going to be doing a lot of research because of all the specimens that we have stored. So build that in the infrastructure would be important. Thank you. Wilbur, Thank um, you. I just want, this is Chris. Uh, I just want to mention that in addition to the public support, one approach that may be considered and it's at a larger level would be a public private partnership where you engage the commercial entities which have a vested interest uh, in the maintenance of these um, biorepositories uh, for obvious reasons. And I think those conversations happen and they happen periodically, but they should be fostered and, and tied to the individual biobanks in, in a concerted way. Yeah, thank you very much, Chris. Yes, public-private partnership uh, is crucial in that case. Uh, so now this is quickly, Katika, you can uh, comment on this because I saw you are... Uh, uh, by repositories that uh, can be utilized. The question is, uh, how easy do you have a database link to your by repository? If yes, how cheap and easy is it to manage a computerized by repository? You could also suggest some softwares you are using to manage your by repository. Just in one minute, com comment on running uh, a computerized uh, by repository. So the, uh, this is now the latest trend in virtual biobanks where uh, the samples could be anywhere and um, uh, you are now storing information at a, uh, a, a central point. 
um, uh, that is the virtual biobank that is happening. So uh, Kenyan samples can stay in Kenya, Ugandan samples can stay in Uganda, Tanzania can stay, and but the uh, but the information is centralized. Mm, uh, it will need a lot of IT support and expertise and a lot of bandwidth. Um, so if you are thinking of that, kindly be um, uh, uh, aware of that, and you will need a sophisticated program like the LDMS or uh, software management. Um, you, there are some free e uh, software programs, uh, which I haven't used yet, but I'm aware that now they are available, but how, um, uh, whether they can hold the capacity or not, we are not aware. So um, I, again, cannot quantify it in terms of uh, uh, monetary, but it will need a lot of IT support. Great, thank you very much, Katika. And I think this is a very important question which we can all end on and actually lines up with what I wanted to ask. Uh, the question is from Siko Ongaya. Uh, what are the ethical issues on preserving clinical samples for patients who have not consented for research purposes? And actually builds into my question was, how do you uh, deal with the ethics of samples for which you do not have immediate research questions? Uh, because normally when we are consenting, we consent uh, participants for uh, certain research questions we want to ask. So how are you dealing with that? And I would like a comment from each of you uh, half a, uh, a 20 seconds, 30 seconds, as we got the end of the hour. I start with uh, with uh, Rogers. Yes, th thank you, Wilba. So um, how we deal with the ethics, currently we have what we call broad consenting. Uh, knowing that uh, a sample can be reused to answer many questions, we encourage uh, our researchers that as they collect samples, instead of being specific to their study area or disease, let it be a broad consent so that that sample can be used for any other research or any other disease. Thank you. Thank you, and Brandina? Yes, uh, similar to Rogers, uh, we keep samples which we have consented participants that will store samples either for uh, analysis which cannot be done immediately and they will be done later or for future use, but this has to be clear because if we, we don't have that sentence within our concept, then we don't store the samples. All right, that's very good. And uh, uh, Katika? Thank you very much, uh, Wilbur, for that question. Um, Blanket consent is now getting out of fashion, actually. So um, we have to be very specific, especially now that we are entering into the stage of genomics and proteomics. Um, uh, and it is a difficult thing um, for us. Uh, we had to destroy a lot of good samples because they were uh, intended to use for a particular project and um, they would have been a, a source of very valuable information. But uh, if the consent is only for a project, then they have to, after a limited period for seven years or whenever uh, stated in the proposal, you have to destroy them because this is ethically the right thing to do. Um, and um, uh, blanket consent, as, as researchers, we would like to do it. We would like to use your specimens for future research. I think um, uh, the new guidelines are um, uh, shying away from this. So we have to be innovative at the way we think and uh, explain and uh, take consent. Uh, and uh, really, if you're going to be, uh, the world is going into genomics. So with the new laws and regulations, I mean, uh, we need to go in that direction. Thank you very much. Thank you, Katika. And the, the chair, if you can just allow me a few seconds, I wanted to ask Katika, because do you think uh, it's wise to think of the possible research questions that you might ask in the future and then be able to consent participants based on those possible questions. That would be correct. But um, uh, I mean, for example, look at the pandemic. Uh, three years ago, we did not even know that such a thing would happen. So we could not even imagine. Um, but yes, if you can uh, think of questions, that's what we are doing for the U54 projects uh, that we are working on. We have the questions that we are doing this research, but 
this is what we would like to do uh, in future with these samples. So consent them on that would be useful. So at least there is some substantiality and there is some, um, uh, some thought processes going in the concept, then the blanket consent that we- Thank you very much. And thank you the speakers for answering the questions and the audience for the questions. There were a few more questions, but I know uh, these questions will be even answered after the, the speakers will answer the questions and answers will be returned to you. And now over to Chris. Thank you, Wilbur. Uh, and thank you uh, to our presenters, uh, to yourself, to the great conversation. This is could have gone on for a half day uh, program for sure. Um, uh, we will have the uh, recording of today's webinar available on the coalition website. Uh, we will do our best to uh, attend to the questions and the, from the Q&A uh, session that will have some additional answers and discussion available on the website as well. Um, we do have a post webinar survey that I encourage everyone to, uh, to respond to as it helps us uh, both think about this, these particular questions, but prepare for future webinars as well. So thank you very much for joining us and be well and safe.